Can I say welcome to Drawing Projects UK? Uh, I'm Anita Taylor. I'm um, the founder of the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize and also of Drawing Projects UK. And I'm also the Dean of Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome everybody um, this early evening, late afternoon um, for our drawing discussion. And our drawing discussions are fairly informal events. They're really where we focus on the role of drawing within individual practice or within particular themes. And there's something that runs as a program throughout the year at Drawing Projects. This particular series are held in association with the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize and supported by Arts Council England. And we, while the show has now concluded at Drawing Projects UK, it's shortly to open at the Cooper Gallery at Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. So we're just between uh, showings um, and we're really, really thrilled to have as the very last uh, participant in the drawing discussions in this particular series, James Robert Morrison. And James Robert Morrison uh, is an artist who has three drawings in the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize exhibition. And we're really thrilled to welcome James to talk to us about his drawings. And we are really thrilled that we've got a lovely audience today. So those of you who have known or joined the Drawing Projects Drawing Discussions previously, please use the Q&A function to ask, chat, ask your questions. If you have any other questions about the organisation of the event, we'll be monitoring the chat as well, but the Q&A will send the questions directly to us. We have also with us Fiona Cassidy, who's helping manage the chat and the Q&A, and that's the format and the process. So we'll have a conversation or James will talk about his drawings for up to about 20 minutes and then we'll open to the audience for questions. So please feel free to roll them in uh, and to share. It's intended as a participative event. It is a webinar format, um, but we really look forward to hearing from your questions. Where you're joining in from um, and to understanding most importantly, more about James's drawings. So James, welcome. Uh, James, for those of you who don't know, is a graduate of Grace School of Art in, um, at Grace University. I'm going to get that one wrong. Uh, Robert Gordon. And uh, went on to do a postgraduate pro uh, course at UAL at Central St. Martins. But James will tell us a little bit more about himself, about his drawings, uh, and then we'll roll into the Q&A. So welcome, James, and over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, so, yeah, as Anita said, I studied at Grey's and then St. Martin's. Uh, I graduated from St. Martin's in 2002. Um, and for the last kind of 17 years, I've actually just been working, um, first of all, in a commercial gallery in London, and then I moved into the public sector where I worked in expert licensing for cultural objects uh, for 12 years. And then in 2017, I moved to the UK government art collection. Uh, I went part-time in January, 2019. And that's basically when I went back to the studio and started my practice again. Um, kind of at that time, I was kind of working mainly with uh, painting um, and embroidery and also embroidery and collage. Um, and these, these drawings that were submitted to Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize, uh, they were kind of a change in direction for me. Um, I take the bus to work pre-COVID um, and I get the bus at the same time as school kids, kind of high school kids on their way to high, high school. Um, and I overheard two of them discussing a gay couple in their class uh, and they described them as having never more than a fag paper between them and that kind of stuck in my mind i'd never heard the term before um and you know i, I kind of thought how different things were for me at that age you know i realized i was gay when i was 11. i didn't come out until i was 20. you know i basically chose to hide my sexuality for that amount of time because at that time um the world was a different place really you know um 
G to Section 28 school was a completely heteronormative environment. Uh, there were no kind of out and proud public figures uh, or couples. Like I, I didn't really have anyone to identify with in that sense. So it was kind of reassuring to think that things had changed and these school kids could talk about this in a bus, something I would never have dreamt of being able to do at that age. Um, and it kind of got me kind of thinking, you know, what did I have to identify with? And, you know, I, I kind of started a collection of gay pornography kind of in my teen, teenage years. And I could kind of made me think that I remember looking at the pornography and kind of identifying with that in a sense because it's you know seeing two men being intimate with each other and then that kind of led me to I still have the collection of work so it kind of led me to um, decide to find some images of couples that looked kind of intimate less sexual and more intimate uh, and then basically draw them on the cigarette papers um, and that's kind of where the title comes from and obviously the medium as well um i think the 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 surface is quite important to the drawings um if if it wasn't drawn on fag papers i don't think it would have as much power um i kind of an example i link to is barbara walker's series louder than words uh, where she did some portraits pencil portraits and paintings of her son uh, and they're they're kind of beautiful portraits in their own right but the fact that she's drawn them on digital scans of police stop and search documents that her son was given kind of gives more power to the work in that sense. And I kind of see a link with that and me drawing on the fag cigarette papers. It kind of gives, you know, it links the title, it links the kind of inspiration behind it, but it also gives the drawings much more power than to say if they were just drawn on cartridge paper. Um, so that, that's kind of, where the, the kind of inspiration came from for them. Um, I wondered if I move through the images for yeah. you, because there are the three drawings in the show. So there are the two horizontal drawings which are made um, with the cigarette paper in that horizontal format, and then the other drawing, which is a vertical uh, drawing, yeah. which is, uh, it. Uh, a bit um, well it's more physical it's more um direct in terms of its relationship to gay pornography um, yeah anyway. yeah i mean the, these are basically the first three in this series that i did um again to kind of start drawing with this level of kind of detail and intensity that's something i haven't done for a long long time but as i was kind of thinking of my memory of me in my teenage years um, and what I kind of identified with as something, you know, something to identify with a gay couple in that sense. I kind of thought, well, you know, what, what, how was I creating work at that age? And that, that was pre-art school. And I spent a lot of time drawing uh, from my dad's encyclopedias and drawing from like mm -hmm. Smash Hits magazine. So like you're my favorite musicians and things. And I would try and copy it kind of as well as I could. And that kind of felt appropriate for me to kind of draw in that kind of way, which is if you look at my Instagram or my website, you can see it's quite different from the other work, but there's still kind of cohesion there. But that was quite important for me to kind of start drawing with that. And it, it kind of brought me back to a happy place um, where I was just drawing because I love to draw. You know, I wasn't drawing because I was at art school or I was trying to get my higher art or my GC, my standard grade art. It was just pure pleasure in that sense. So it's, it's quite nice to kind of go back to that. And I have kind of continued with this series and kind of will continue with it. And that's, that's kind of been really enjoyable in that sense. I suppose this third one is slightly more sexual than the other two. Um, it's not kind of intentional. It's just three images within the collection that I kind of was drawn to and felt like, I, I think it was more the background that kind of appealed to me in this one. I really like. Mm -hmm. The background and I really wanted to draw it kind of thing but I, I don't know you know I mean yeah I suppose it is more sexual but there's still an intimacy so it's kind of like I see all of these works as kind of like snapshots into something like a, a snapshot into someone else's kind of life that you wouldn't normally see in that sense you know you're kind of looking in on something. They're, they're very tender aren't they in terms of um, I mean even the one that's more sexual not 
there's no reason why it wouldn't be it's very tender mm. in terms of the embrace um you know the the kiss um is you know it's a very they're very tender drawings and they draw you in mm. um you know we were really struck having them at drawing projects uk how mesmeric they are for people and they're, they're people really respond to them uh in terms of their intimacy in terms of their surface uh you know and that that relationship to the photographic um you know the graphite on the cigarette paper does something also in terms of the visual reference you know it's slippery it's glossy um so it feels like a you know a magazine photograph in terms of its surface or something akin to that yeah um, I mean, and yet, of course the piecing to when you i use uh 2b 4b and 6b pencils mostly but for the darker bits i'll go 8b 9b and when you go in really heavy with those it gives such a nice sheen i mean it's difficult to photograph but you can kind of see it in the image to the uh, the left and the top right like they kind of shine which kind of made me think of the magazines the glossy magazines in that sense um so that, that is quite appealing and also just like you know you have to be it's quite difficult to draw on them because they're just kind of stuck down. You know, I just basically lick the the gum section on a cigarette paper and stick it down. Uh, and when you're drawing, you sometimes get some rips and tears and they kind of peel up a bit. But I think that really kind of adds to the work. It gives it a fragility maybe, and um, it just gives it more feeling in that sense. So I, I think, you know, again, I'll say the surface is very important in these works. I think what I've chosen to draw on in that sense. Um, absolutely. I mean, clearly there's the, the meaning and the, the riff in terms of the cigarette paper, the fag paper, the everything else. But there's also something very beautiful, isn't there, about if you think about when you lick a cigarette paper, um, it, it has a, you know, it's an intimate, tender thing that you do. Um, so there is something about the piecing together of these and their subject um, that has a physicality, um, which really sits you know, immaculately in terms of the the subject, the content, the intent um, of them as drawings. Um, and that piecing together, you know, the many different parts, um, you know, maybe starts to also have another kind of sets of references too. Yeah, yeah I mean, my work, you know, when I, I came out when I was 20, mm -hmm. so I was in my third year at Grey's. Um, going into my fourth year, I started to make work about my sexuality in the fourth year, but I think after kind of concealing it and hiding it for so long, I, I kind of was making work that was kind of shouting about it in a sense. Um, and that work kind of continued at St. Martin's, although it kind of went down a little bit, but then to kind of have the 17 years away from it and to now go back to making this kind of work again, I've had time to kind of reflect, I've had time to grow up and kind of learn to live with myself, accept myself, etc. So I feel like the work has a more kind of tender feel to it and it's more about looking backwards and kind of making sense of what was going on then that I couldn't have made sense at, at the time but now I kind of can um, and I think you know drawing is something that kind of runs through all my work in a sense anyway I mean clearly I'm making a lot of pencil drawings now but I kind of you know when I paint I paint with acrylic pens I don't use brushes so it's more like a drawing with paint uh, my collage work, I kind of see that as a quicker way to draw in a sense. And I use a lot of embroidery work as well, which um, is like drawing with a needle and yarn or wool or whatever. So I think drawing is something that's kind of running through everything. And it's quite nice to kind of go back to doing this. And I've kind of forgot how much I just love doing kind of representational pencil drawings. And, you know, it's really brought back that great feeling that I had when I was younger so it's, it's been a real kind of joy to discover it and go back to it so yeah it's, it's really good. It's fantastic I mean the, but the, the other work also has a photographic reference doesn't it the embroidery work uses photographs as a base which you then uh, erase, erase uh, uh, lose as images and then yeah. stitch into. Um, I think uh, you know for me that my I first realized I was gay when I looked at pornography basically and I've kind of been thinking back about these memories of realizing I was gay, my choice to conceal it, and then eventually coming to accept and understand it. So I think 
the fact like, I kind of think, oh, if I hadn't seen that pornography, how long might it have taken me to realise? But the fact that I did see it and, and realised, but chose to hide it, I feel this link to pornography in a sense. Um, and, you know, I started my own, kind of collecting my own pornography at that point later, but as I got a bit older. So I kind of, I suppose I want to, I still have that collection. I kind of feel like I want to reuse it, like reappropriate it in a way. So I'm kind of using it throughout my work, whether it's outlines of figures, direct pencil drawing representations like this, or whether I'm cutting them up or erasing figures, you know, it's all coming from that kind of pornography. Sometimes I do have to source some online if I want a particular thing that I don't have in the collection. So it's not purely from the collection, but it just feels like something I have to kind of use and make something new out of the old in that sense. Which, which in terms also talks, I mean, I guess in a way it's interesting that the collection becomes an archive that becomes your memory bank, if you like, in terms of coming out or your transition through, um, you know, your own personal history. Um, so I, I guess in a way the work does have different kinds of work. Um, and I wondered if, I mean, do you want to tell us, what, I mean, you said that you're making more of these. Um, yeah, so I've continued with these. I do some other uh, mm. drawings on cigarette papers. Uh, they're slightly different because I actually, I piece them together in a different way and I actually glue them down. So they're much more stuck. Uh, and then again, I'm using imagery from pornography of sexual acts basically, but I'm blacking out the sexual acts. So you just get a face mm. basically. And it's, it's quite, I mean, if you know, you know what has, it's been blacked out, but if you don't know, you kind of see this face that sometimes looks in a slight bit of anguish or uncomfortableness, which, and I call that the Conceal Cover Sensor series, which is again about me kind of con concealing that out of my life in that sense. Um, the Ghost Within Me series, like I kind of discovered by accident that if you can erase the image from the pages of these magazines. Um, so I've been done about 10 small works where I erased basically a, a, a figure, the model from the page. And then I've kind of worked embroidery on top of that, but worked from behind. So you're seeing the embroidery you wouldn't usually see in that sense. And that kind of relates to the idea of the fact that I basically erased my homosexuality in that sense. Um, and it became like a ghost that was living within me. Um, and then when I raise the image of the figure, it looks like a ghost. So it kind of all ties in together. And then the fact that you're seeing the embroidery that you wouldn't normally see, again, kind of ties into that person you're not usually seeing kind of thing, it's kind of hidden. Uh, and with the painting, uh, it's something I started at St. Martin's. I was working with uh, paper clothes patterns. Um, I would kind of draw, attach them to canvas and draw round the pattern with uh, permanent ink pens and it would kind of print through and then I would add figures from pornography onto that and then repeat it and rotate so it kind of becomes quite confused um, and quite busy and then I would embroider some of it so that's something I've kind of continued but I've stopped using the ink pens and I've been using acrylic pens instead and the idea behind that is kind of you know the main function of clothes are to protect and cover yourself um, and by using the patterns, uh, templates, I'm kind of deconstructing the, uh, the idea that I protected and covered my stuff by denying my homosexuality at that time. So, and the pornography kind of relates to that. So that's that kind of series as well. So yeah, there's kind of a lot going on, but they all kind of are linked in that sense. They're all linked to drawing as well, I feel. Every element is kind of drawn in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think they strongly are, you know, drawing and that relationship to receive photographic image and the imprint that drawing gives you the capacity to to overlay or imply uh, within that. So drawing obviously plays a really big role within the work. When we met, when you came up to the to see the exhibition um, at Drawing Projects, you, you talked also about your other influences. I mean, you've talked about um, the way that you relate to Barbara Walker's drawings, um, but we also talked about early Hockney and we also talked about um, Ellen, I think. Um, so I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit about the wider context. Yeah, I mean, work. I think Hockney is a given in that sense that, you know, he was making kind of homoerotic queer art before it was even 
criminal uh, decriminalized in 1967 mm -hmm. so you know, it was incredibly brave to be doing that then and it's kind of at the time it was kind of slightly more expressive and abstract but then later on when he moved to california it became more representative and i, I think his um kind of domestic scenes of couples being intimate and sexual with each other that's kind of a big influence um tracy emin i guess it's her kind of using life events as inspiration um and it's kind of con confessional in a sense you know that kind of appeals to me plus her use of embroidery in that sense you know it's she talks a lot of her work is very personal and i think my work is quite personal in that sense i'm maybe not using images of myself in that sense maybe like she does but um it's you know the work itself is very personal there's, there's kind of another artist i didn't mention but david robili art as well um you know he combines he's a poet but then started making art and he kind of combines language with kind of angular portraits um which kind of reveal things the the language reveals things about himself you know it's, it's really nice poetry um and it kind of links language and stuff so i mean although i'm not using language within my work i think the titles kind of reveal things in that sense so he's he's been quite a big influence as well yeah that, that's really it sets a context i mean I, and for me that you know two boys together clinging uh hockney's that very beautiful uh drawing and painting it's painting isn't it um is really has something around these which again is that very tender intimate close space um so you know while it's a a, a long-standing um image you know from the 60s it still seems to have that resonance of being in the present uh in terms of your work and your references um i'm wondering if people in the audience might want to to ask uh questions i'm not sure if anything is coming in yet through the Q&A, we, we will talk for a little bit longer, but um, it would be good to think about the questions coming in. Um, and, you know, we talked, to, you talked just um, about the importance of the titles. And I wondered, is that something that's long standing uh, with you? I mean, this is very much, you know, taken from the conversation heard on the bus. Um, but could you say a little bit more about the use of titles and text? Yeah, I mean, I think this is quite new for me, titles, because before I would just, you know, when I was working with clothes patterns, I still do this, I just call them pattern number, whatever number the pattern is. And I kind of struggle with titles, you know, I kind of think, oh, you know, you think of something clever or whatever, but these, these kind of are very natural in that sense, you know. It's clearly taking what I overheard, uh, you know, talking, saying there's never more than a fact paper between them. I mean, I don't know whether, the the person that said this meant it in a kind of derogatory way you know that the fag as in faggots or whether he just meant it as in fag as a fag they were so thin there's nothing between them they have such a great relationship you know because it, it kind of works on different levels in that sense so i mean again that's the power of the surface and what i'm using and it just kind of makes sense in that way um so yeah and the titles of the other series again they just kind of came naturally cover censor conceal was very much what that's about um and then the ghost within me you know that just is the ghost within me and i've just kind of numbered them so i think it does give away something it can be a bit ironic maybe and give more uh to the viewer about what it's about in that sense that's terrific we do have a question that's come in and we'll start to take some questions we'll still keep our conversation going and there's a question from Serena Thompson uh, which is when looking through source images can you describe the moment when you see an image that will become a drawing does it meet certain criteria or does it just grab your interest yeah I think for this series it, I very much wanted to find images in the pornography that are intimate and not sexual you know and when I when I was that age I think Pornography to me, it was more about finding something sensual rather than sexual in that sense. Mm. You know, everyone other, everyone else in school was able to watch TV and see, you know, male and female couples, young age kind of dating and going to the cinema and stuff like that. So it kind of, you know, I know these couples in the magazines aren't real, mm. you know, actors pretending to be a couple. 
it's fantasy in that sense. But then I was having my own kind of fantasy of them being a real couple in that sense. So I think it's very important that, you know, the first two that you can see just now, that, that it's very much more of an intimate part. So probably, if, I don't know if you, anyone, if you've looked at pornography, it's usually in a storyboard format and it starts off two guys kind of meeting until the end, basically. Um, so these mostly come from the start. So it does take, you know, time to kind of go through and find something that is kind of, more about intimacy and less about sex. So I suppose the other, the third one uh, is slightly more sexual as we've discussed before, but you know, you can just tell, it's like, it kind of gives me a feeling. I suppose for me, it was couples that I, when I was that age, I was looking at them and the ones that kind of attracted me in that sense. So that, that's kind of what I would go with. Um, and, you know, as long as it's a decent size as well, because if it's too small, it'd be quite difficult to draw. So you've got to try and go with bigger sizes, although I do copy them and blow blow them up a bit bigger some of them so I can't do them bigger as well yes, that's really interesting too and these are actually very early aren't they in the series that's the this thing that the first three so I started yeah. these in January this year I uh, finished them I think February time mm. and then basically I stopped and went on to other things which is something I do quite a lot I've got quite a lot of series going on at the same time because I think if I do the same thing constantly, I start to get a bit bored of it. So I'd like to kind of change and chop. So I kind of stopped that and did some collage and embroidery work and then did some more pencil drawings, but a different kind of style. And then I have gone back to these now and I've done, I think, three or four more to the series. And I'll probably keep adding to them because I think it'd be really nice to have an exhibition of them all together at some point. So it'd be really nice to see them together, I think. I think it would be. I mean, I think as we went through the selection process, um, you know, these two drawings sit together very well, but it was very difficult to not see all three of them together, you know, and it's quite unusual to have a sequence of drawings through to the final selection of the exhibition. So, it, it, you know, their sense of being serial and needing each other and needing each other equally, I think is really important to seeing them. So I, I agree. Seeing a larger show of them would be really extraordinary, I think, yeah. uh, and very interesting to see together. There are a couple yeah. more questions coming in around the making of them, mm. um, which um, somebody, Elizabeth, wanted to know whether you make preliminary sketches of the ideas prior to making the fag drawings, or do you, you know, do you know what's the process? I mean, do you make the, do you know how large it's going to be so you construct yeah. the surface? Um, um, yeah, so I would find the image I want to use first if it's a decent enough size in the magazine which doesn't happen often um, I could just work straight from the magazine just measuring and then measuring out on cartridge paper the amount of you know the size I need to put the papers down and then it's a case of just looking the papers down on and sticking them to the cartridge paper but if it's not a good enough size I'll kind of get them scanned and then printed out bigger so I can work on a bigger size in that sense. So again, it's just a case of measuring uh, and then putting that measurements onto cartridge paper in a square and then basically just sticking the papers down, which, you know, it's, it's really boring <laughs> and quite frustrating as well. <laughs> it's a repetitive thing. And then sometimes they don't stick and then sometimes they go a bit squint. I mean, you can kind of see on the one at the bottom, they're much more haphazard than the one at the top. But I think sometimes I'm really careful about it and other times I'm a bit more lazy about it and they tend to be a bit more haphazard in that sense. But yeah, it's a case of measuring and then getting the drawing on. And because you're using the papers as well, like it kind of works as a natural kind of grid format as well. So you can kind of get yeah. the drawing a bit more. I think that relationship to the grid is really interesting, isn't it? Because it does have another set of reference about that transcription of photograph. Uh, to draw an image, you know, the squaring up, the the transition from that. Um, so something about the process as it, again, it's multi-layered yeah. uh, in terms of how it works. Mm. Um, there are quite a lot of questions coming in. So, and if I click on them, I think I might slide on the slide. So forgive me if that's what happens. Um, but the there are questions coming in from... Um, Lee Campbell is asking what would happen if you use cigarette ash to create the drawing. So I think that's thinking about a different kind of dimensionality of materials. I mean, is that something that would be of interest or relate to the way that you work? Yeah, I mean, of course, everything's up up for kind of 
consideration. Um, you know, the, the control with the pencil is good for me. It's just something I like to draw with. Uh, I haven't tried charcoal yet, but I, I did, you know, you can buy licorice um, cigarette papers that are brown. So I have put some of them down and I used some white chalk, um, which possibly wasn't soft enough. So maybe I need to look for something a bit softer, but I mean, I, that took me a while to get my head around because I was drawing light instead of shadow, but you know, it still looked quite good, but it was much more free uh, and less uh, detailed. Uh, it looked much more expressionistic, which was nice. Um, so that's something I might go to. Ash, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, possibly if, if I could find some way to do it, but yeah, I mean, I definitely want to kind of keep exploring. I, I guess. It yeah, I mean, I guess it's a question about the materiality and the the meaning of material uh, within uh, the work itself. There are there are more questions, so I'm going to keep asking um, from the questions, and we'll uh, add some more in in between. Uh, Lorna is um, with lots of very positive commentary to saying thoroughly enjoying the discussion uh, about your recent body of work, but she's intrigued between these pieces of beautifully tenderly realistic drawn pieces where the figures can be identified and the comparison with your new works where identity is hidden and is asking if that's an intentional narrative. Yeah, um, so I, I think she's probably talking about the Ghost Within Me series. So, yeah. I mean, that was very much about erasure in that sense and me erasing my homosexuality when I realised I was gay up until I hit 20 in that sense. So that kind of... I find that quite interesting, the idea that you, you know, I'm actually erasing the image for the, the pornography that I was growing up looking at, concealed away, nobody knew about it kind of thing. Uh, and then it kind of looks like a ghost as well. And then the idea of me erasing that kind of made me think about, well, that homosexual true self was like a ghost inside me. So it all kind of links together. Although I am kind of giving some kind of face and kind of linear representation to the figures by embroidering but again as I said I was embroidering on the reverse side so you're seeing what's usually on the back which again makes it less kind of detailed and kind of correct but much more expressionist and I don't know it gives it a different feel but yeah it's quite different in that sense from from these yeah They're very different. I mean, the, there's an, another question coming in from Gavin, um, which is about, is there a celebratory aspect, do you think, or a kind of nostalgia or sense of what might have been in terms of these drawings? And maybe that links to the last question. Yeah, I, I suppose when I overheard the kids on the bus, you know, that was my first thought. I was like, oh, God, this is amazing that they are talking about this on a bus and they have a gay couple in their class that are open. It just made me feel like so good that, you know, things have progressed so far. And I'm not really kind of looking back, kind of upset that I didn't have that, but it's more just kind of pointing out the fact that I didn't have that. And it's, it's something that a lot of people do, you know, Russell Tovey recently did an interview where he spoke about Section 28 and how you had yet to, you know, go to the library to look at pictures of men that he wanted to look at. Uh, I read an article today by Will Young talking about the exact same thing. So it's kind of quite a thing at the moment, I suppose, in that sense that gay men my age are kind of, you know, appreciate what we've got now. But, you know, you have to kind of look at the history to kind of see how you got there in that sense. So it's important for, I suppose, younger people to, to know that history in that sense. You know, when I came out, I knew nothing about gay history at all, but I've had 17 years to kind of read about it and learn about it. And, appreciate so much more of what went on before me and then what's gone on while I've kind of came to terms with my sexuality and kind of lived that life that was my true self, my authentic self in that sense. So it's, it's quite nice to kind of go back to it and make work about it as well. So yeah, it's, it is nostalgia, I suppose, but it's also relevant to today in that sense, I think. I think it's celebratory as well. Yeah. I think, the, the, I mean, it, it is such an enormous transition uh, in that period of time, and it's a short history, isn't it? Since mm. that happened, but hugely influential uh, in terms of the way that we live our lives and the way that we can operate to mediate and talk about all sorts of uh, different subjects and topics. So hugely important, yeah. and hugely important to celebrate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the a couple more questions, which are more about process uh, coming in. Um, so there's a question 
uh, which is about the break from practice that you took, because you talked about, you know, you, you did your MA quite quickly yep. um, and the different break uh, in practice that you've had um, from working in the art sector. And the question is, did it give you a, a fresh, raw approach to your mark making and um, the way that this works? I mean, this is somebody who's saying the vulnerability and the innocence and the lines works beautifully in regard to the concept. So it's a very positive comment. And just asking you about that space that taking a break from making gives to you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not like I kind of wanted to take a break really when I finished St. Martin's, but it just, you know, I held a mound of student debt and, you know, I couldn't really find a way. Plus five years straight study, straight from high school to mm -hmm. Grays, straight from Grays to St. Martin's, you know, it, I don't know how I feel that like it's great to be educated, but then I kind of feel a pressure as well in a sense of like like it sometimes takes the fun and enjoyment out of it a little bit, and it becomes quite competitive. And you know, you want to do well, you apply to things, but you don't get in, and other people are being successful and you're not. And I mean, I, I guess there's that kind of element of it as well. But I, you know, I just took on a job and worked for 17 years and kind of got into the work. You know, I did three years in the gallery, 12 years in export <coughs> licensing and then, then the government art collection since 2017. So, you know, I've kind of loved all of those jobs and I, I've always thought about making work, but I just kind of never got it together to do it because I don't know, I just, I, I felt like if I want to do this, I want to kind of do it with a good amount of conviction and effort and have everything set up in that sense. So, you know, the debts are paid off um and i'm in a position you know where i'm able to do this i could go part-time quite easily um and you know i got studio 10 minutes walk from the flat and i kind of went back into doing it and picked up where it kind of left off at st martin's um and then even that's kind of scary and panicky you know confidence is a big thing maybe 17 years away from it was to do with confidence as well and you know, feeling confident enough to do it you know it's, it's difficult enough showing your art to the world but when it's so personal it makes it even more difficult in that sense so i think it has definitely changed i mean although i'm still doing painting similar to the canvas work at st martin's you know everything else is quite different you know i was doing embroidery then but the embroideries kind of became slightly more complex and different and then as i said before these drawings are completely different to what i was doing before but it's you know i don't know it's just i remember reading somewhere about you know, if you've been an artist, you should make work that genuinely you feel happy making. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> making other stuff, I don't really enjoy it. I feel stress about it, you know, so, but this has brought me back to that, I'll say it again, happy place where I was just drawing because I love to draw. And it's, it's just this reignited a passion and excitement, I suppose. Plus, you know, when you have some recognition, like getting three into Trinity Boy Worth Drawing Prize, it kind of moves you on a bit more as well and gives you even more confidence. So. It's just, it's just been a good, good year in that sense, starting these drawings and start the year to where I am now and kind of continuing with them and doing other stuff on the side as well. So it was, yeah, it's really good. Oh, I mean, it, it's terrific to see and terrific to hear that. I mean, you, within your um, day job, you, you see a lot of work though, don't you? I mean, you're not um, devoid of seeing lots of work in the real, um, which in a way is a kind of nourishment um, to thinking about making your own work? Yeah, I mean, when I moved there, I mean, when I worked in expert licensing, I would see a lot of artwork, but it was always photographs of artwork. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you only license objects that are more than 50 years of age. So it was mostly older work. When I went to the government art collection, uh, part of my role is the secretariat to the advisory committee. So three times a year, I'm getting to view artworks that our curators and director have brought to the committee to consider for purchase. And it was just, it just reignited that passion for contemporary art that I still had, you know, I still went to exhibitions, but it, you know, seeing it and then hearing people on the committee talking about it and it just kind of lit a fire underneath me, I think. And then I thought, what are you doing? You know I mean? You could be doing this. Yeah. And then I basically spoke to my partner and he's like, go for it. And spoke to my boss and she's like, that's fine. And it just all, kind of fell in place in that sense so you know I have you know that to thank really because it kind of was life-changing in that sense to get that job 
get excited about contemporary art again and then make this step to making it myself again so it just kind of came full circle which which was good which is, which is great to hear and i I mean, I think, I mean, it's never too late. I mean, and that's the, you know, the most important thing is that you come to things at the right time and you make things at the moment they're right to make. And I think when they do have that authenticity that, you know, there was a need to make these drawings and you had the trigger, you know, the conversation on the bus, the, the whatever it is, and that serendipity that makes it the right moment uh, to realise something, you know, is something that you can't really predict. We all make frameworks within which to make works and to realise ideas. But the moment of magic quite frequently can be just that thing, which is just, you wouldn't have heard it any other day, any other moment. And it's the trigger to something uh, that makes you realise or test an idea in a different way. So, I mean, they're, they're full of that um, wonderful moment of newness, I think. Um, so there's a real looking anew uh, within them and a looking anew at the source imagery as a looking anew at how you might make the materiality of them, you know, how they're constructed. Um, so that they give a huge amount in terms of their process to their meaning, to the happenstance within which uh, an idea comes into to being. There are, there are a couple more questions about medium, but I'm going to ask you the question that Barbara Walker has popped into the chat for you, um, which is when looking for opportunities or exposure, are you selective in choice of spaces to show your work? Are you interested really in the public space, commercial space, or is this something that sits in a different kind of space? I'm adding a little, Barbara. Yeah, I, I think I haven't really got that far yet, to be honest. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. last year, I exhibited the same two paintings uh, at two exhibitions, one at Candid Arts Trust and one at the London Ultra exhibition. And then I did a specific small piece mm. for some park galleries open because that's my local gallery. You know, I live next to the park. Um, and then this year, Trinity Boy basically is my first exhibition of these works in that sense. Um, I haven't exhibited uh, them anywhere else um, and I haven't exhibited any of the other works either. So, but you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think an exhibition mm all the the five paper drawings in this series together I think would be really nice so i'm still continuing with it and i think that is the aim to get to do that at some point but um yeah i mean i, I you're open to suggestion yeah i mean whatever kind of works in that sense you know i mean yeah i don't know I, I, yeah whatever i'm yeah open to suggestion i guess that's the question about whether they whether well, you're open to suggest, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think it would be great to see them together. I mean, and I guess the question about um, do they, is there something about ownership for them as well in that question is that, you know, if they go into collections, is there something that changes for you around that? Uh, possibly. I mean, I actually found myself in a situation last month where I was approached uh, by a friend wanted to buy one of the new ones and a collector in the US wanted to buy the other one. And I've kind of agonised over this because they're uh, two of the favourite drawings that I've done mm. since. And I was kind of, oh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the one that's gone to my friend, you know, it's framed, it's gone, it's sold. But, you know, he will give it back to me to exhibit if and where I want. Mm. And part of the deal with the American collector was he will allow me to exhibit it if and when I want, if I pay for shipping and shoes. Sure. So it may be gone, but it's not completely lost in that sense. So, you know, it's kind of difficult isn't it you know you need to make money to kind of keep making work but you know you yeah i can't hold everything back in the hope that i'll be able to exhibit them somewhere at some point no. but hopefully that will happen but i mean that kind of was quite a move forward for me because that's the first thing i've sold since i've gone back into making work and i kind of always thought oh god the work i make is not that sellable but it was never really the point and anyway. it's more making work for myself but for people to either learn about something I've gone through or some other gay person they know might have gone through but also for gay people who have gone through the same things to appreciate so there is a market for that in that sense I suppose and if people want to buy them then clearly it's not all just kind of relating to me I no I, they're, they're at a distance aren't they they're, they're, they're totally personal um, but they have a, an image room because they're of other people and it's about your overlay of imagination uh, in terms of the subject so there is a there's a space isn't there there is a cigarette paper between that yeah, um, yeah. and 
the director experience. So they, they are, you know, beautifully um, sitting in all sorts of spaces, I would say. Um, there are a couple more questions around materiality, one from Lee um, asking about unfixing the drawing and using the graphite as a soft um, medium um, and thinking about the relationship of impermanence of materials, I think. And it comes back to that question, I think, about cigarette ash. Um, yeah. Um, earlier. I sometimes do use a graphite stick on the background to kind of get coverage done quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's just, I don't know, the, the pencil just seems to work so well for me. And the fact that it gives that shine off the paper is just... And, and the paper itself is impermanent, isn't it? It's not... Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's... I don't, I don't know, I haven't really thought about conservation <laughs> issues, but... Uh, yeah, it's very fragile. And, uh, I, I, was, I wasn't really <laughs> worrying about conservation. <laughs> and it was that sense. That, I mean, it's very provisional, isn't it? I mean, it's oh, a provisional right. um, paper. You know, there's a glue. There's all sorts of stuff mm. that happens, which, mm. you know, you talked about them unsticking or sticking. Yeah. Um, so my sense is that, you know, there is something about the fragility or the apparent fragility. Yeah. The paper, yeah. I think it's probably less fragile than we, we think. Mm. Um, but there is some, you know, it's transparent, it's, you know, it's malleable. You can see these images really clearly how much it just doesn't, you know, the boy mark making undulates the surface. It does all sorts of things to it. So the, there's a level of sense of impermanence or flux um, around the ground itself that you're working on, not just the graphite and whether it fixes or not. Um, yeah. I mean, in some of the other ones I've been doing as well, that it, it's it, I've noticed if it's raining and I've left it out while I'm working on it, and the studio window might be open and it, comes back, it kind of affects the paper as well, and it makes it a bit more wrinkly, which is quite nice as well. And it starts to kind of look a bit like skin as well. And plus, fag papers get called skins as well, so there's that kind of element to it as well. So yeah, it's 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 just something that seems to work for me. Yeah, it's something that works beautifully and uh, all of those analogies and um, references are, are really important, I think, to the reading of the work. Um, there's one more question from Lorna, which is, have you explored inverting the images where the couple's identity would be obscured in a negative form um, in these, this set of work rather than the, the ghost within me series? Uh, so, did she mean drawing with the light instead of the shadow? Or? I believe so, but Lorna would have to. I'm not sure that we can get a quick yes into the chat. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm so suspecting that it, it is about positive negative. Yeah, so um, with, yes. um, I mentioned the licorice paper. So, licorice uh, cigarette papers are kind of like brown. So, I have experimented with one drawing so far, which was inverted. So I was drawing the light as opposed to drawing the shadow, which took a while to get my head around. But, and it looks much more expressive because I can't really get the level of detail with the chalk pencil I was using, but I might try and find a pastel pencil or something that might be a bit better. Uh, but that, that's quite interesting because it became more expressive um, and it, it looks very, very different, I suppose. But I did try a pencil on the uh, licorice papers as well. And it, it's, that's quite interesting too. It comes out kind of silvery and you can't really see it unless you're at a certain angle, which is also quite interesting about that kind of hiding of sexuality and stuff. So there's definitely more exploring to be done, I think, with those. Brilliant. Um, I think that it's been a really interesting conversation to have. And I think there's so much, they're very insistent drawings. Um, you know, they're quietly very insistent. And I think that's their magic and that they pull you into this very intimate space. Um, and they're slippery, they're silvery, they have all sorts of references, their provisionality, and they're very much about the senses. You can see me moving my hands. I mean, they, they're about touch, they're about taste. Uh, you know, they're, they very much um, have that sense, um, you know, that it is about a sensory experience. And that's, of course, essentially what they are. Um, and I think, you know, that the importance, I guess, with these drawings is that it's the kiss that's important, isn't it? It's not um, the negation um, of the image, maybe from the other work. Um, and I think there is something about that celebration of, of the kiss, which is incredibly beautiful within them. 
it's something that everybody, as I've said, has responded to in the show. And they're very quietly insistent because they're quite modest drawings. You know, their their size is modest. They're piecing together. Their provisionality um, has a modesty, um, and I don't mean that in a maybe modesty isn't the right word. They 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 are modest to some degree, but they deal but with a very explicit moment and a moment to celebrate. Um, you know, the male kiss is just it's really very beautiful. Um, and a very uh, important moment um, to make these images which own a space and they own the space in this very big uh, public exhibition. So I really look forward to seeing a collection of them together. And I think it is exactly the right thing is to be thinking about um, you know, if there is such a thing as the right thing, but to think about seeing a sequence of them, um, you know, way beyond the two or the three that we have. Um, and seeing the new drawings come through on Instagram, um, it would, you know, it is a very big, important series of work, which we're really privileged to see. Is there anything that you'd like to add or to say in terms of a um, closing moment? I don't think so. I mean, maybe just thank you for, well, thank you to the judges for choosing them and the opportunity. It's just, you know, I think a lot of people applied to, I mean, I've applied to countless things over the past year and had lots of knockbacks and this was the first kind of big acceptance thing. But I think it's important, you know, it's good to apply to things because you get your work seen by people. Um, you will get rejections, but then there's certain things that your work might just fit better than others. So you know, I encourage people just to keep applying to things and keep sending things. And the more rejections you get, it kind of gets a bit easier as you, it goes along. <laughs> Um, but you know it's 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 a good thing to do, and I'm so pleased you know that they found a place within Trinity. Boy, you know I've kind of known about this prize for a long time, and uh, I have to kind of pinch myself that I've been included in it because it's, it's you know I'd never in my wildest dreams thought it would have happened. So yeah, it's just been a really good experience, you know, to to get into this prize and get the work exhibited as well, which is quite important. Get some kind of interest in the work as well which, which is good so it gives, gives you confidence most artists I think have that kind of confidence crisis and if you get some kind of recognition it kind of makes things you know feel a bit better for you and kind of spurs you to keep going in that sense I think I, I, I'm not we all have to learn what gets in and, and what doesn't get in and sometimes great drawings don't get in too but people see them and I think what's really important for me is that we see all the work or we see and this year it was done slightly differently but the final work was all seen uh, from that long list um, and because for me it's the materiality um, clearly the selectors make their choices in relationship to what's submitted and I think this year's exhibition for those who haven't seen it has a broad selection it's a diverse group of drawings that deal with drawing in different ways different systems different ways of thinking about the world. Um, so it's a very broad and very diverse show for its 71 drawings of, by 56 people. Um, but there is a space within that for something that sits absolutely immaculately into or meticulously in terms of its subject content rendering um, and how that sits in the world. So it's when those things come together in their form um, that they're very successful and the drawings are very successful um, that you you have in the show. Can I say the biggest thank you to you? Thank you to everybody who's joined us this evening. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Um, it's been a, a real privilege to hear your focus for the work, to hear about your interests, to hear about actually the remarkable period of history in a way that your personal history maps and that capacity to look back um, and to celebrate, you know, a space post section 28 that couldn't have been thought of as you grew up, as you were a student, um, I think is really remarkable. And it's been a real privilege to hear you talk so very directly about the referencing and to talk about how these drawings have come to be and why they're so important to make. And a real, you know, many, many congratulations and thank you so much for 
participating uh, in the drawing discussion. Thank you very much for being part of the show. And we look forward to seeing you again on the tour and to seeing and hearing more from you around the work. And there's a one final comment in which echoes everything I think that we're all thinking, which is to thank you for opening up about something so personal and somehow delicate uh, and to say how inspiring that is. That's from Edma. And that really is. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Fiona, for driving behind the scene. Uh, but our biggest thanks to you, James, for a really inspiring conversation about three really inspiring drawings. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.